Entrepreneur Business Live, I would love to say, but sadly it's behind us. That was last week, and um, in a few weeks from now, we'll have uh, an, the last one of the year. I can't believe it's all finishing uh, so soon. It uh, feels like this year's gone really quickly, but um, I really enjoyed it last week, and I wanted just to start by just saying it was a wonderful thing we did on Wednesday. Anyway, welcome everyone to uh, Startup Business Q&A. Uh, this is episode 120 uh 120 weeks i'm just making it a milestone because it's got a zero on the end i suppose but 120 weeks ago uh we started this uh so it's, what's that two years and an almost a half and uh the question has been flooding all the time and this week we're going to look at content creation so hello on uh youtube hello on facebook hello on instagram and thanks everyone for listening on the podcast as well what i'm really interested in is your questions specifically about content creation, both on commercial side, but also in terms of technical side. So how would, though, in terms of technical side, so how would we do it? Uh, what are best practices? Things like that. And because a lot of you are on social right now, I'm really interested in your feedback as well. So do put comments in. This is the first time I've actually done a comment, uh, sorry, a, a stream specifically on this space. So uh, do um, chime in if you want to. And um, I want to just say thank you so much, everyone, for joining in. I'm just kind of waving back to everyone uh, whilst I'm uh, talking. So thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, here on Instagram. Uh, my goodness, there's loads of you. And uh, everyone you on, uh, on Facebook as well. Couple of announcements. Firstly, I'm going to be in Geneva in December on the sixth on the in the LinkedIn local panel with Catherine Dar. So thank you very much for introdu uh, introducing me to that. Uh, the next Entrepreneur Business Live will be on social selling. That is using social uh, media or working with social media to actually sell, and that will be on the uh, the twelfth of December. So watch the live stream in Entrepreneur Business Group on Facebook. But also in January, we've got uh, the release of dates for um, London very soon, for January and February. Uh, but January 24th will be Entrepreneur Business Live USA. And it looks like probably April 4th will be Entrepreneur Business Live Barcelona. And we're yet to organize a date for Entrepreneur Business Live San Francisco and Melbourne, Australia. So I'm going very, very aggressive in the new year. And it's nice already Rather than being at someone chatting about it, we're actually nailed these things down. So dates are in place, they're being booked off and we're actually organizing them. So we're doing it as opposed to talking about it. That's my style, I suppose. So let's get into questions. We've only got a few today. So if you have a question about uh, content creation, then do fire it in here, wherever you might be. And I will start with Ian Tisker, who's asked, Richard Moore, when developing content, have you found more traction in developing platform specific content or general content distributed across multiple platforms? What this gets into is this idea of should you be producing different types of content for different types of platforms? And the classic answer is, well, yeah, then yes, you are. Ian, I've just seen you just come online. So hello. And I'm answering your question right now. Yes, you should be producing different types of uh, content for different platforms, but it doesn't mean you purely have to make a video on YouTube and then a video on in, on feed, on sorry Facebook or so on that is slightly different to each other. You need to just think about where there is overlap. For instance, right now on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, and a podcast, you're all getting precisely the same delivery. Okay, so it is all the same. It is basically the same stream run through with a couple of cameras. Okay, so in this instance, it's intelligent to run the same thing. There are other instances where it doesn't make sense. If I'm going to do a business tips article, it does really well because I'm a contributor uh, to, uh, so contributing to um, the likes of Influensive. Um, it do does really well on you oh, sorry linkedin as, as an article it does really well on medium as an article it doesn't do as well on um facebook as an article because unless because that's just not necessarily the platform for it you need to have in mind the idea that people will use the platforms for different reasons as you do you pretty much represent probably why other people use the, use platforms as well so for instance people use facebook to be way more social especially now the algorithm pushes that more uh, rather than gaming it, hey, like my stuff, engage my stuff, buy my stuff kind of thing. Where And LinkedIn, you know, people are there a lot more to do business networking. And so you need to think about what you do there. What I strongly believe in is repurposing. So, for instance, this live stream forms a podcast, but also 
I will take a snippet of it later this week, a couple of minutes, will be repurposed as a shorter video that will go out to, uh, to LinkedIn, uh, because that might be a nice uh, tip to add in there. You see what I mean? So, but then the type of content I produce on these different platforms does vary. And more often than not, unless I feel there's a crossover, the content I produce, for instance, for LinkedIn doesn't come over to Facebook as much. Um, I've tried the duplication. Not only does the algorithm tend to not like it, but moreover, you're just duplicating what you're doing to an audience that may well be in different mindset. It is the same people, but they are in a different space. It's like if I'm buying, if I'm, if I walk into a grocer's, I'm the same person that walks into a bookshop, but I'm there for different reasons. A better example even is if I walk into a supermarket, I'm the same person as someone who goes to lay and sunbathe on the beach, but I'm there with a very different state of mind. One is I'm in a purchase state of mind, okay? I'm very active state of mind, whereas on the beach, I may be active or calculated in, in sunbathing, but I'm not there in a buying state of mind. I'm there to chill. There's a very different vibe there. And so you need to tune in to the people's mindset or more specifically, why would someone be on that platform right now? They may follow you for business and, you know, business advice like they do for me, for instance, but you do it in more of a way that, that it, um, leans to the propensity of those to consume content on that particular platform for a particular reason, such as I want to see more of an emotionally led, not necessarily upset, but emotionally led, fun, uh, social delivery of content on, say, Facebook um, than I would on LinkedIn as, as a good uh, example of dichotomy. So I would say certainly mix them. I think certainly look at uh, repurposing, but but just be mindful that some content doesn't uh, make it to other platforms. And ask yourself this, this simple filter each time. If you feel that a reason why you're going to post from the same piece of content from one uh, platform to another is because of laziness, as in, oh, I don't have time, but I know I should post something, I'll just put that over there, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. Unless you get lucky and it happens to be just right. You're doing it for the wrong reason. What you need to be thinking is a bit more calculated. What's my audience like when they're on this platform? What are they interested in consuming? So that's what they need. For instance, even within Facebook, I've got my profile, I've got my page, I've got my group, I've got my club. Okay. So if I post a motivational meme on in the Entrepreneur Business Club, which is a premium club designed for people to be on the same level and interact and practically help each other and collaborate, a motivational meme is far less effective or interesting or valuable for that space because whilst it's the same person even on Facebook, there's a nuance there where when they're on the, in the Entrepreneur Business Club, they're there to collaborate. They're there to see if there's someone who might be able to help them out. It's a tool with practical utility as opposed to a place to more passively consume certain types of content. So with that in mind, you need to think about how you deliver content even across the same platform. So a uh, thumbs up if that makes sense, but that's my philosophy on it. Great question, uh, Ian. Thank you much for for um, answer, so for asking that. So the answer actually is, is you do both. Some content works across all the platforms. There was a post I put out last night that went onto Facebook. It went onto uh, my LinkedIn company page and onto Instagram because the tone of it fitted all three, but that's a rare thing that I would produce a piece of content that does that. You see what I mean? So uh, you need to think about it. Think about your audience, but also why are they on that particular platform or in that particular space? If it's a group within Facebook, it doesn't mean they're going to be all social because it may be a group that's more in a business sense. Do you see what I mean? If you go to the ClickFunnels group, which is Russ Brunson's uh, group with maybe 100,000 people in it, they're there to talk about, you know, content marketing and funnels and uh, e-commerce and, and adverts and things like that. So it's quite far from social. Those that get traction probably do it in a bit more of a fun way though. So just worth bearing in mind. Having said that, I want to add a, an additional caveat that is if you're working on LinkedIn, don't 
um, presuppose that people on LinkedIn are in a dry business like only state of mind because people are people first and the business people second, right? So it doesn't matter if they're some uh you know traditional industry or something like that they are people first which means they will respond to certain emotions or humor or whatever ahead of anything else is a, is a balance and it's a difficult one uh thank you very much for uh, for that question though so any questions on content creation how you do it what i've done with it any questions around um best practices i'll do my best to answer it give you a bit of a flavor of what i'm doing um i've been around for uh, in terms of actively doing content creation and getting great results for probably three to four years now and every day showing up doing something i've tried literally every type so everything from youtube going live through to podcasts through to video on linkedin uh all the way through to an audiobook download via a um uh, a uh, video posted on Instagram stories. I've tried loads of things, and I think that uh, there's a lot of things that have worked really well. I get a huge amount of inbound, so people asking me uh, uh, to work with them or opportunities, or for instance, like last night, I checked my phone after dinner and someone had bought one of my business courses as a result of seeing me through content I created online. So it's worth uh, thinking um, about making sure you're using it if you have some kind of business to, to, to you to, to, that could use it. So let's have a look at some questions here on, on Facebook. Daniel Nunes has asked, he's written a bit, so I'm going to put it all up. For artists who are trying to create a community for other artists to post gigs and elevate the standard for their particular niche, which might be caricature art, how would one engage young up and coming artists in an industry that is clichist? Uh, okay, and where the older established artists are a bit more exclusive. It's the same as everything. When you're trying to build a create, you're talking about creating a community. If you add the element of patience, imagine you could pause time, okay, then you would go and speak to people manually, one by one. And the reason why I got ahead uh, on places like Facebook and Instagram is over the years now, every day i engage with brand new people and you can't beat that consistency because it does nothing to start with but over the months it really adds up so say hypothetically daniel that you go out of your way step away from your content and your community or your uh you know whatever it might be and go to where other people are. It may be a group. Let's just keep it online to make life easy. You, might, you go to a group. You might go to a uh, fan page. You might go to some area or space online where that niche inhabits, uh, 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 you know, what kind of, whatever space it might be. And you engage manually with three people each day to speak to them about their world, to share ideas, to provide meaningful comments about the size you've written here so a paragraph with an interesting uh, idea if you do that each day even to just three people well that does nothing unless you're lucky that someone in that three people happens to be you know on on the absolutely world-class level with a huge amount of, of following but little by little across a month we move to a place where there's 90 people that we've engaged with 30 days in a month, right? Across it, which is almost nothing as well. Across it's a year, now we're 1,080 people, which is still only a small amount. But the difference is that 1,080 people also will include within that 316 who actually are quite interested in you, from which 40 are really keen on you, and all of them have a network and those 40 who cumulatively have a network of 7,124 are able to when they share and engage with your stuff are then going to pass on word about what you do when you pause time and throw patience in the mix you just can't lose so whatever you're doing be impatient because you want to get there fine but act now so start literally now on it and if you're not doing it at all, I urge every one of you after this live stream to reach out to someone with mutual friends who has an interest in the same area as you and just say hey to connect, not game, do not write anything, just to connect. Because if you add a few of them each day, 
it all gets moving fast. Now, because I was impatient, when I started this practice in 2004 into 2015, I was doing 20 a day, 20 conversations a day. So you can imagine the following day, there wasn't 20 new people. It was 20 new people plus carryover from the previous day and maybe from the day before. And maybe the guy who didn't catch up with me uh, two weeks earlier, who was like, hey, sorry, I missed your comment. And it all gets insane. But by doing that, it meant that it exploded very quickly. So a lot of people, the question I get asked the most pretty much about LinkedIn from those who uh, followed or engaged is in March this year, when you started producing content, you seem to explode very quickly and you're getting great results and traction since then. What is the thing? Why is it that you seem to explode? I mean, that's a relative term, of course, but explode and, and do very well and get a lot of people starting to ask you things and, and engage. It's because a disproportionately large amount of my time is spent focused on that community building. So, yes, I put out a piece of content each day, but moreover, 95 percent of my time was spent with anyone who dared come near my stuff. So if I look on Instagram right now, we've got Christine Robinson, you've got uh, Diana as well. Uh, so Christine's over in the States, Diana, Diana's over in Australia, hello both. Um, and so on, and these are people that, for instance, who, I've, um, who I connected with probably six, seven months ago on LinkedIn. And I connected with them and rather than going, cheers mate, as a comment, if they dare to get engaged in my content, what I did was I actually DM'd them and then I got into conversations and hopefully they'll give me a thumbs up or a heart if I'm right here, but I didn't try and game them and sell them straight away. Instead, it was like, let's hop on a call, let's have a nice chat. And uh, I'm actually still trying to organize the call with Diana because I'm so rubbish, but um, Diana, we do need to speak uh, about Melbourne and Entrepreneur Business Live if you're free as soon as possible. But my point there is that by spending time with the individuals, over time, you gain more than the sum of just those individuals because they each have networks as well. And for every 100 people that doesn't really care when you engage with them, there'll be five who are like, wow, this is great, or you world, or my perspective wasn't like this, or, you know, hi, this could really help me, and share this. And I have a network, I didn't realize, of 2,000 people, and, and of those 2,000 people, 300 actually pay attention, and of those 300, six really could do with your stuff, and, and it snowballs more than you realize. So that's how I would do it breath till then okay but within a month daniel within a month of going crazy on this i really started getting some results people say oh it's, I'm, I'm seeing you everywhere you know you're showing up and things like that and this isn't a brag it's just application right that's all it is so so hopefully that helps that's the way i look at it uh, another question uh, brandy holloway uh, so it's a good question thank you uh, daniel brandy holloway has asked suggested balance of personal content over business content on LinkedIn. Well, that depends, doesn't it? Because it depends what you're doing. I think that it's important to show yourself. If you can show yourself through your content, then great. Because I predominantly provide content on LinkedIn that pivots around the, um, the, like the device for it is business and sales techniques and, and, and ideas and things like that. But I do it in my way. And so if there is an opportunity to kind of smile or laugh or be a decent bloke, then I will make sure that's there as well. I don't shift to stand up. But what I'm doing is working on the basis that I want to draw in people who want to be into my stuff. Um, because the stuff I talk about is stuff I, I it's like a hobby is what I'm interested in. But it's also what I do for work. So I, it's interesting we need to look at definitions here because personal content could be, you know, it's my birthday today and I want to share how happy I am. But if you look at how I did that back in October, on the October the 8th, put in your diaries for next year, um, what I did was I produced a, a video that said, it's my birthday, I wanted to say hi and thank you for the last 12 months and here are five wins that, that I feel have come from this network. So I was saying thank you to people. And so it was a personal thing, but it still had uh, a reason why, uh, you know, a, a business uh, reason why, which was to thank the supportive network, which in turn was, was the reason why I've been doing quite well. So it's a difficult one. And I think, 
I think what you need to do is experiment and play. Why not do both in your videos anyway? You could argue this is not personal content, but argue that it really is because it's just me talking, right? Those of you who have met me or inter interact with me will know that I'm not fronting as someone else. It's this is just what I'm like. And so in a way, it's, it is good personal content because ultimately the play is that people that are familiar with you, therefore trust you and like you, are more likely to do great things with you. And that's the aim. So uh, it's an interesting one. We should talk more about that, Brandy. Uh, hello, uh, Diana. Also on Facebook, thank you so much. Just dance, Daniel. I like it. Uh, and uh, let's see what else we've got. Any other questions? Um, Dan Dan J. Verma has asked, if you can talk about blogging, content creation, return on investment, and impatience. It's a huge topic. Let me just take blogging then. There's nothing wrong with blogging. It's a big thing. I feel that, in, in fact, the articles and longer copy is having a resurgence now because there's nothing wrong with videos, there's nothing wrong with images, and there's nothing wrong with short copy. The reality is that you, in your audience, no matter how niche it is, people would like to consume different things. And it doesn't mean all the time. It means in certain times of the day, they'll want to consume different things. For instance, if I'm chilling in the evening on a Sunday and I pick up my phone, I probably am cool with reading long copy. Today, not a chance because I'm not interested because I'm doing other things. So think about time of day and things like that. I think what you should do is focus on what you do best. If you're great at blogging, I engaged with someone uh, yesterday actually who said, um, I'm, a, I'm a great copywriter. I also am a contributor to a part of Forbes and a part of Entrepreneur. I was like, so copyright then, <laughs> like produce content on that. You know, uh, and the, I think the way to to the way to win is to leverage the thing you're good at. If you're good at blogging, so blog. As usual, as with a product in a startup or a service or a type of content that a medium that you provide on, the problem typically isn't how good it is. Because look, look at the production here. I'm just sitting on a chair that I turned around in my office. It's not an epic production. Yes, it's in HD. And sure, the, the value might be there. But the reason why people show up is because of distribution. And so really your problem is obscurity. So blog all you like. Go on a failing platforms. If you, I was talking to someone the other day about this. You can go on to elo.com, the failed version of Facebook. That's now more for, for creatives. You could go on to Vero still. You go on MySpace, there's still a community there. If you can make it win because you engage with people and build a community around you, then, then you're fine. And as Seth Godin says, you only need like 250 people in your space to, who are genuinely interested in you to actually make it, make something. And I think that um, in terms of blogging, if you're good at, that, you're good at it, so blog, for instance, on your website, but then repurpose that, get it on Medium, because it's winning. Go back into uh, LinkedIn, look at LinkedIn articles on LinkedIn Pulse. I feel that um, that's kind of coming back again. People are now spending more time with that. Uh, that that's my view on it. And just looking at that last point you've added there, uh, Diana and Jay, uh, looking at um, patience, as much as you can hold your breath, do. If you look at my Entrepreneur Business Live events, I can, I am being as aggressive as I can, but I also am patient. So it can make zero money. In fact, it can make a loss as far as I'm concerned for the first year or two, because what I'm trying to do is create a buzz around it. And so what that means is I don't care about the, obviously I do care about the commercial, but the commercial isn't as important as the awareness of it. So, so as a test last month, so last week's event, it was completely free. Because it was completely free, I had loads more people sign up to it. It doesn't matter that they all couldn't make it, less people attend if it's a free event than a paid one. But now a load more people were involved in some way. Do you see what I mean? So it's about distribution and combating um, obscurity. That's the thing you need to work against. So hopefully that helps a bit. Uh, Ivan, hello, good to see you here. Um, Sai Satish, uh, thanks for being a, a regular. Um, Ian Tusker is asking again, which content works best on the various platforms? It doesn't work like that. What matters is that you look at what you're good at. I'm good at live, because this is episode 120. I'm also good at talking to camera, because I quite like doing it. Um, I'm good at writing. I enjoy writing. So I'm quite good at that too. I'm trying to come across not like arrogant, but the stuff that you're good at is the content that tends to work best. 
if you look at LinkedIn, in fact, if you look at any platforms, it varies. For instance, on Facebook right now, because it may change, a picture will do better than text because the algorithm will favor an image over text on its own. So if you put if you want to do text only, so do a screenshot and post it as an image to get the algorithm to kick off. This is something I was reading about yesterday um, to kick it kind of kick it off. But it's still writing text. You see what I mean? So you, you should be thinking about what it's difficult because rich content video images, they tend to do well. It's not so much about the platforms that you should be focusing on gaining the algorithm as you should be thinking about how people engage. Where is your pattern interrupt? Where is the thing you're doing, and this may be your type of content, that's going to make someone you know, doing this passive subconscious scrolling go, oh, hang on, what's this? And when you can work out that, that's when you'll win. So it might be that my, my content, the actual copy I wrote, right, is absolute dross. But I get the engagement because my my headline is interesting. So an, an example of this is uh, must have been four or five months ago. To prove the point about pattern interrupt, I posted a, an, a long copy post on LinkedIn that started with the line, I'm pregnant. Now think about that on, on LinkedIn. It's just not what people post on, on LinkedIn. Plus, it's a bloke posting it and Thirdly, it's not business related, really. So it was like there's kind of something completely different and it stops people in their tracks. It's like, hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Boring kind of starts to copy. Then I'm pregnant. Oh, what's this? Now, the article might have been rubbish, but I got the engagement because I, I, I did something that thought about how people would stop by and consciously engage to look at it. And that's the kind of thing that matters. Content, like I said, about products and services as well, almost doesn't matter, although you'll get a reputation after a it's rubbish. It's the way in which people engage with it. I received, it was amazing this morning, one of the first things I did when I got in my office, I received an email that was sent at like quarter to one this morning from a guy who just bought my Monetize You course. And he'd taken so many notes and had some questions and he shot me a 10 minute video. He'd uploaded it to Dropbox, spent all this effort and sent it to another. So the first thing I did was watch this amazing video. It was really lovely. This guy wrote a testimonial. I'm sorry, he said a testimonial and said how great it was just to me. And it was just talking about how great and how engaging it was. But he didn't know that the course was any good. He engaged in that content, Ian, because he he was um uh, fr had framed me uh, to, you know, it was like positioning. He thought this will be good content because I, there's a level of familiarity and trust because I keep seeing Richard and I like his stuff. So think about that. It's a case of how do you get people to like your stuff? Well, you get people to like you and they tend to like your content even more. The nuance is, oh, you should perhaps do a little bit more copy or perhaps do a, an image kind of doesn't matter as much as how much people are into you. If I was Bill Gates, who is one of the biggest followings on LinkedIn, I could post a picture of the back of my head and I, you can guarantee he would get more than 10,000 likes. OK, and huge amounts of views because he's got distribution. So the, the, the content that works best is the one that you're comfortable with. But it doesn't matter how great it is. I could be Hollywood level of performance, but no one's going to, no one's going to, no, not, con no content is going to work better than others unless I have an audience who actually are interested in watching it. Okay. This could be the greatest live stream ever, but I wouldn't be doing it unless people showed up every week and asked me questions. So if that helps, this is a really great question, Ian. I'm not going at you. It's just a valuable moment to, to talk about this kind of thing. Adam Mosley, hello, thanks for coming in. David, thanks for coming in. Nolan James, hello. Ryan, hello as well. Gosh, there's a long name. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry for uh, not saying it. <laughs> um, Fabian Rosaki, hello, good to see you. Uh, Sherry, good to see you. You do camera well, thank you very much. Truly encouraging. Diana, hello. Uh, I think that's all of you. So let's go on to the next question down here. Sushi Despande, who, who's from Singapore. Thanks for sending us through. Richard. Uh, should we believe in algorithms or continue to create content in the way we do? We should believe in algorithms because they exist. I think there's Vero that was trying the chronological, there is no algorithm thing, but you know, whatever. I think, I think the idea is that you should 
you should be aware of it because it will help you scale it when you have a, a large number of following, you know, when you've got a lot of people who are going to be interested in your stuff or when you're putting money against content as well. It's very powerful to work with your algorithms. But more important, I believe, certainly to start with, is to focus on content that resonates with you first so that that speaks your language that is working with the way in which you like to engage. So if I like to write, I just write. And I know someone on LinkedIn who only does long copy writing, no images, no that, no video, nothing else, just she writes long copy. It's because that's what she's good at. That's what she gets engagement with. She's not tried video or anything else, but she likes doing writing. So that's fine. And the reality is that it probably does fine against the algorithm because early on, people engage with it, meaningful comments, and then she comments back and then it kind of gets passed around, so no problem. Um, the main thing is she's doing the thing she's into. Because if video was the only thing that got, you know, through the algorithm and got kickstarted, well, then we'd all try. But there's no point when you're going to get vacuous engagement because it's seen by a lot of people that, that you get no, you know, no views on it. Do you see what I mean? So I think I was on the back of my mind. There was some piece of content I saw earlier today, and I think it was fascinating because they had very few followers and they had very few views, but they had huge engagement. What that represents is someone who's really done well with building a, a community that is retained. Because if you can do that right, people will want to spend time around you. And so when you post something that they think, oh, that person just posted again, I'm going to tune in. It's a bit like the Star Wars effect. If Star Wars releases, it, there's a new, with Disney I should say, release a new Star Wars film, everyone goes to watch it. Why? Because they like Star Wars, not because that film's any good. So just think thinking like that's important. Um, continue to create content in the way you do get you know do the thing you're good at but sure of course you should pay attention to the algorithm um, a good example is that if you post content for a certain region and you don't put it out at the time where that region tends to want to look at it then you're missing a trick you can't just post it and leave it out there and it'll be sitting there waiting for them in the morning they would have to go and hunt for you by then so for instance I post often in LinkedIn, either quite early in the afternoon or more likely around 10 o'clock at night. That's become my sweet spot. Because if I do it earlier, the US, which forms 70% of my audience, doesn't engage with it nearly as much. Why? Because they're busy having their days. 10 o'clock seems to work with multiple time zones quite well. Same in the UK. If I posted something, at, I think it was at first thing in the morning, like, like four in the morning or something, no one's up. And then the US is too sleepy. It doesn't tend, tend to work so much. So you have to think about things like that. Isn't it? That's an extreme example to, to prove a point. But do think, like, the algorithm does matter. We don't overthink it so much that you're uh, not producing content that, that is enjoyable to create, that you're good at doing. All comes back to the same thing. Have those seeds, which are those people in your community that you're engaging with regularly. Because if they like you and you like them and you get on well, they'll show up for you. It's as simple as that. And you can't do it once or twice. You have to constantly be in touch with them because those plates need to keep spinning. As simple as that. Uh, let's do a couple more questions. One here from Adam Mosey. I think you're watching over on uh, Facebook. I think I saw your name pop up. Richard, do you personally think it's the, uh, it, what do you think is personally the best way to cover important topics without it becoming repetitive? Uh, it's a good way of doing it. Good question, actually. I'll give you a lot of the questions I get asked on Startup Business Q&A. Are, are repetitive. What I do is I, I've, I've shifted to make it a thematic um, uh, live stream each week. So rather than having startup business Q and A, which is where it used to be, it is now focused on a particular theme. So this week is content creation. Before and the same with my my um, uh, business uh, events as well. Each month is a slightly different theme now, rather than too general. Um, What's the best way to cover important topics? You need to vary it. I think a good way to keep doing uh, working on important topics is to say, if I've already made my philosophy clear, and if I recognize that not everyone's going to watch that one piece of content, so I need to repeat it every so often, but that gets dull after a while, well, then I need to bring other people in. So leverage other people. For instance, the collaboration videos I do on LinkedIn and, and sometimes on Facebook uh, with me and someone else isn't an interview. It's just a chat. And I grab a snippet and I post it. And 
that's about often it's about linkedin we talk about kind of that ecosystem so if i keep talking about linkedin all the time on my own that gets dull but by in injecting an alternative perspective as in someone else's we get their view as well and people get to learn about a different person and how they view things so i do think that you just got to switch out how you do it often it can be as simple as doing it in a different location um the reason why i feel the startup business q a works each week is because it's often a lot of the same people showing up to come and look at the uh, at the content. So a lot of you have been here uh, for many, many weeks in a row, if not from the start. It's the same person running it. I have the same answers to a lot of questions, but the questions each week are based on different themes and they come from slightly different people with slightly different perspectives and slightly different things happening in their world. And as a result, it keeps it reasonably fresh. So that's why I do it. Look at different ways of producing it. So for instance, alternative people involved in some kind of collaboration or ask your audience to provide some idea about what they might want uh, and that way it will work so for instance uh, adam i know you work with nutrition and personal training if you're doing press-ups every single day and, and posting about press-ups that you do each day that might get a bit dull so you could be the guy that does press-ups in different locations now it's interesting but it doesn't become it's not about the press-ups now it's about locations where it's going to be the next day or you could do press ups with someone else or you could get idea, you know, collaboration, I would think would be huge in that. And in fact, uh, the Entrepreneur Business Live next month on the 12th of December on social selling. Uh, one of the speakers, Lauren Tickner, is here in the UK in London, and she um, she has over 200,000 uh, as an active following on social media. 125,000, I believe, or 130,000 of which are on Instagram. So she's going to be talking about how she kind of monetizes that. And, and she's the kind of example of someone who I, I could just talk about content creation, but instead I'm bringing out else someone in to get their perspective instead. So I think collaborating, Adam, is a really good uh, angle on that. So hopefully that helps. Danny, we've asked another question here. What contingencies do you have if Facebook, Instagram, YouTube were to crash respectively? YouTube is rubbish <laughs> for the record. It crashes all the time. The last few weeks it's not bothered to go live. So what? you look at um, Entrepreneur Business Live, we were streaming live to the group around the world. Anyone could have watched from the group of 3,600 people. Um, I had people tweeting and Instagramming in the event. I had probably 40 people sitting there watching it. It was the only November event. And the entire thing, uh, or, or the entire first uh, hour with uh, myself and the other two speakers, Chilan and Dot, um, had a slideshow as well including our charity partner that was going to run a video on this huge projector so everyone could see it. And the projector overheated in the minute as I was starting the event. It overheated, shut itself down, and the projector started going up. It was like, good, okay, you have to fight. Okay, so what do you do instead? You do something different. I whipped out my laptop, showed people the video, because that's what the charity partner needed, Chilan very well uh, stood up and got on with the slides, uh, uh, speaking without slides. All of us could wing it. That means that's because we've got good speakers who know their craft. Um, but eventually, and then, uh, then eventually, you know, whilst, whilst they were getting on with it, I was fixing it, simple as that. And we got it back on about halfway through Chilan's uh, uh, presentation. If it was to crash retrospectively, and I've had this before, it's not the end of the world. There aren't contingencies really other than one I put in place some time back where rather than running all of these streams through the same thing, I do them on, in different ways. So I have YouTube on a webcam that you can possibly see here uh, is running through a PC that is using Wi-Fi. I have another phone that is running the Instagram stream. So that has a full battery is only used for Instagram streaming on a Monday. Then I have a third uh, uh, camera on me, another phone, uh, just because phones are easier to use, that is a Facebook stream. And that's not using Wi-Fi, that's using 4G, it's using data, because that way I'm not crunching through Wi-Fi so much uh, and causing problems. So I'm streaming just through data with, uh, with my um, Facebook uh, on my phone, because by doing it that way, I can, I can separate things rather than, uh, you know, Basically, if, if Instagram goes down or if what happened last week, uh, YouTube goes down, I've still got Facebook. And by having it on different different devices, when I, when I download the audio to create the podcast, 
I could do that for my Facebook stream or for my YouTube stream. If I ran it all through one camera, for example, and that went down, so no podcast this week. Do you see what I mean? Well, I think once I had some major chat technical hitch, so I just went live a bit later on. It's no big deal. And the thing is, ultimately, if the house set on fire and I had to leave, it's like it's not the end of the world. It is an element. It's not all about this one thing. The world keeps turning. For instance, because of a number of things that were happening this weekend, there was no content produced for LinkedIn on the Saturday or the Sunday. I engage with the community still because that's what I do more more than the content. But there's no content went out. The world keeps turning when I post a day, people show up and that's the end of it. So uh, contingencies are there, but I don't worry or overthink about it too much. The main thing is just keep plowing through and that works. Uh, Dan Jay, uh, you've asked another question. Hey, just let you know that blog post you wrote on delivering extra, uh, delivering extra to customers, it was simply great, valuable content. Well, thank you. I'm glad you read it and you enjoyed it. Um, could you let us know where that was as well? I think that's the, uh, uh, it might have been on Medium actually. So let us know and I'll, I'll post a link to it. Um, yeah, Daniel, thank you very much uh, for the comments there. And hello, Wild Design Studios. Hello, Marie on Instagram. Hello, Carla. Good to see you here. Hello, um, Ala Prest, I'm not going to bother saying that, it's too difficult, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Luca, Royal Man Self Made, and Christine Robinson's there as well. Uh, let's do one more question. Kurt Mercadante has asked me, who I'm seeing, by the way, in January, January 24th, on Entrepreneur and Business Live USA. He is going to be speaking at the event. In fact, he's the opening speaker to kick it all off, so I'm excited about him uh, being there. Uh, you've asked Richard, what, uh, sorry, some people are so afraid of selling that they fail to include anything even resembling a cta that's a call to action in their content what's the fine line so call to action is at the end of a video or piece of content is saying why don't you do this so for instance a call to action on a youtube video might be make sure you subscribe and hit the little bell button so you get notifications if i produce a video uh dan j you just said my that article was on influencer thank you uh i i enjoy writing for them and uh Clinton uh, Senkow, uh, who is the co-founder, is an amazing guy, and is a bit of a, a bit of a, I'm a bit of a fanboy of his, uh, who found who co-founded Influensive. Uh, people like Grant Cardone have written for it as well. It's really amazing to work with that, and um, he spoke at the Entrepreneur Business Live event. I think it was back in uh, September, or it might have even it was July. I think uh, the inaugural one, so it really meant a lot to me. But yeah, it was on Influensive. Thanks for for checking that out. I should post something else there soon. Um, Kurt has asked about um, producing a CTA. Here's the thing. I was saying this to someone earlier today on, 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 a, on, a, um, on a video I was recording, that your CTA doesn't always need to be there in the sense that it's saying, hey, check this out or do this. I would say firstly experiment with it. A lot of mine on my videos at the end are things like, do you agree? What do you think? or something like that, so people would engage in the comment, comments. And if you think about this, like I said a bit earlier, when you're building community with that question that Daniel and uh, uh, Nunez asked, um, it may well be that all I'm looking for is comments. Because if I get engagement, they are people who have validated my content, who are showing an interest, and it might be that they become leads for me. They're the people I decide to engage with because ultimately I can speak to them and then move to a place where they might buy things, right? Or, or, or do a consulting call or whatever it might be. So by working on the basis that if I can create great content that, that drives engagement, that might be all I really need. So the call to action is more innate uh, uh, as part of the content as opposed to me actively saying, do this or do that. So it's quite difficult. It, I, I have a number of reasons why I put out content. Sometimes it's just to drive engagement so I can engage with new people that that, that, are, that are, 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 are writing comments, for example. If some people are so afraid of selling, they, fail to, they, they do fail to include anything. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with putting a CTA at the end, for example, of a video, because those that have bothered to spend time going through the whole thing are going to be interested, right? So they, in turn are going to want to or be more likely to engage in that call to action. It's like in a newsletter. My month, my weekly newsletter is coming out today at 4 p.m. local. So if you go to my website, therichardmore.com, you can sign up to it. Um, but the idea is that if you have a newsletter with content and value 
and at the end I have PS and a call to action, well, the only people that get that far are the ones who are interested anyway. And the ones that are interested anyway are interested because they dig my stuff. And as a result, when you get to the CTA at the bottom, they're more likely to engage with it. So I think there's nothing wrong with doing it at the end because it, it's like a treat for those who are keen. And if they're keen, they would, if they're not keen rather, they wouldn't get that far anyway. So it pisses no one off, right? But I think if you have this idea of, uh, um, uh, if you have a CTA that is subtle, as long as your UX, your user experience is intuitive enough, then it works really well. And I really think I'm doing this well with my content to profile, to website, to purchase kind of funnel through LinkedIn. So I put out content and often the call to action at the end, Kurt, will be want more or, or interested in more or would, like, would you like to learn more? Um, and or whatever it might be, even on adverts, we do that kind of like those kind of CTAs so are very subtle. If you want to learn more, go to the website, knowing that if enough people check that and some of them go to the website, the website or, or even to my profile, I'll come to, come to the profile in a sec, that enough people go to my website that they will want to check out, you know, or, or rather they won't need to. Um, they kind of want to check things out. But. When they get to the website, it's simple enough to navigate. They will then click onto a purchase page or something like that. So the guy that bought a course last night that I saw on my mobile when I opened it, I'm like, oh, someone's bought one of my course. My, it was my um, um, LinkedIn basics course. That person who I'd never met in my life, I didn't recognize the name or anything, that person spent time on the content and they'd gone, who's this guy? And this is about, this is the profile part now. They then clicked on the profile because of voyeurism and because of just a keenness to be curious that's what people do if someone's interested in someone they'll just you know they'll 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 check them out by looking on the profile they could see it was as simple as hell oh he's got a website who is this guy and they checked it out and then they went and bought the course last night randomly okay or well, not randomly but they decided to do it my point is by making it frictionless and simple and enough people looking at content I almost don't need the call to action. I can say, check out more on my website if you're interested or find out more. Uh, do you like this kind of value? Find out more on my website. And then they will, of course, then, then they will find their way. The idea is that if a thousand people look at content, a hundred might look at my website and six might then buy something. Well, that's fine if I can put 5,000 through my through my LinkedIn profile each month, through my content each month rather, because then 500 check out my profile and go on, to, and then, you know, however many go onto my website and, you know, whatever it is, go to, go to buy stuff. So it does work. You work an economy of scale. And don't think that you're wasting uh, your time and it's not, it's not worth it with all those who don't, you know, engage and buy stuff because those 5,000 just might not be right for some of them. It might be that they need to be warmed up and seven or eight more pieces of content is where they'll then click through to your website and go, I just keep finding this guy. I'm quite interested in his content. Maybe the first bit of content didn't resonate with him, but then the next bit does. Um, it may be that um, that person quite likes your stuff, but is never going to buy anything. But then they share your stuff or write about you. And now their network of 316 people checks it out and 14 of them are relevant here. Do you see what I mean? So economies of scale here is, is about saying, like, work the obscurity angle. So focus on handling or dealing with the fact there's obscurity in your world. If you can hammer against that with your great content, enough people will like it and pass the way through to then go buy your stuff. So um, uh, the fine line, Kurt, is I think there's nothing wrong with having no call to action if you're trying to sell something, if your content's good enough that people and your site or mechanism for buying stuff is uh, simplistic enough for someone to work their way through that if they were to click on you or check you out, then they would be able to sail the way through and buy something if they wanted to. So you're putting inconvenience bias there. I think if you get that bit right, then you're then you're winning even without a call to action. But it's nice to not be so passive all the time because sometimes people just need to be told. Um, and there's nothing wrong, I think, with saying, you know, like, comment and share if you find it's interesting. 
Uh, so do so if you found this uh, uh, live stream of use. Um, I want to finish there. It's been a really good one today. So thank you, everyone, for jumping in. Hello, Judy. Hello, Brian. Uh, hello, sexy baby Joanna. Hello, Akash. Hello, uh, Maimiel. Uh, hello, Olympics. Hello, Marie. And so on. There's a lot of people on, on Instagram today. If you have any more questions, do post them. And I will circle back soon and, and have a chat with you about those. Uh, and I'll answer myself. But otherwise, have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, everyone on uh, YouTube. Thank you, everyone on um, the 